Markets and stock exchanges aren't real places anymore in the sense that you don't have a group of people sitting around. You have a bunch of computers that are all next to each other. And so it's, you need to be located there to do high frequency trading because that's where you can trade the fastest. My own assessment is much more nuanced than that. I mean, he's trying to sell books and he writes a compelling story and he tells one side of it, which there's some, I, while I don't agree with all of his conclusions, I certainly think it has lots of basis in fact. I think there are lots of other things that he left out. Such as? Well, it's endless, the list he, uh, he left out. I mean, so he's telling a story about how some large institutions have difficulty trading a large quantity of a security. Now, these people have always complained that they can never trade as much as they want without prices moving. The book portrays it as though there was some enormous conspiracy and nobody knew what was happening. And that part is just completely untrue. You know, there were people who could no longer trade at the way they used to and they stopped doing as well. And, you know, we can't slow down the economy to help the buggy whip manufacturers stay in business. But that's a long way from the market being rigged. So what do we think about small investors? Well, so the first thing is you want to think about how they're investing. So most small investors who maybe they use Schwab or TD and Ameritrade, most of their trades get sent to these high frequency firms directly. They never go to the public market or undergo any of the sorts of things that Michael Lewis was talking about. And these people have arguably become better off because the spreads, the price between the price which you can buy at and sell at, or the bid and the ask prices, have become narrower over time. So they pay less to trade in terms of the cost of the spread. Now, but small individuals also invest lots of money through large institutions, your mutual funds, your retirement funds, and all of these things. Now, this is where the question, there are more interesting questions about are people worse off because the mutual fund they chose to trust doesn't know what they're doing and is losing money because they're incompetent. Are, is high frequency trading you know, a big issue relative to the fees they charge? Almost certainly not. Does, does it potentially affect people? Yes, it does. And you know, the, the concern is that it somehow would generate a small tax on your retirement fund because every time your retirement funds trades, it now pays a little bit more, your rate of return is lower, so you can have less money at retirement. So I think it's changed the market a lot. And whether the term rigging is just so poorly defined. And the, the really interesting question is whether or not, how do you think the markets should be organized? One of the big focuses of Michael Lewis's book was this new sort of alternative trading system or dark pool or their hope to become a stock exchange. So this is IEX, which was founded by a bunch of people who realized they couldn't trade very well under the new system. So they tried to start a new market that they thought would better serve the types of needs that they had had when they were trying to trade. And this is usually what economists really like is basically if there's some problem in the market there's, that's not working very well, somebody can come up with a clever new solution to solve that problem. Price efficiency is in some sense, we want to think of prices as being correct. Now there's a challenge of ever knowing what the correct price is, but there's, there are, the, so Eugene Fama won the Nobel Prize this year and his view on efficient markets one way to think about it is if the price is right now, it me the price is right now at this time, that you can't predict what it's going to be in the future. It's just as likely to go up or down, rel perhaps net of some compensation for the risk you're taking. But basically prices are unpredictable in a very statistical standpoint. And so that's where we start by thinking, okay, 
I'm really not sure what the right price of any stock is, which may be the net present value of all its future dividends and its growth potential and all these other things. But what I do know is that stock prices are efficient if they sort of move randomly. So we got some data from NASDAQ that identifies a group of high frequency traders. So NASDAQ knows who its customers are. Typically these firms are loath to let anybody else know what their trading strategies are, so it's hard to get this data. And so we got it, and it was, there are all sorts of caveats about it, but we got it. And then we tried to look at how does this relate, how does their trading go along with the price process? Meaning, does their trading help predict future price changes? And the answer is yes. And then we want to look at, well, how does it do this? Sometimes when prices overshoot where they're going to be in the future, there are some times where they take a while to get there. And that's what we think about, you know, if the price isn't right, do they help get it back to the right level? The interesting question is, would that happen without their trading? Because if they go and they make money by making prices more efficient, but the prices were going to get there anyway, then they're probably just a tax on everyone else. If what they're really doing is helping the market work better, then, then this is beneficial. What's the benefit of going from a microsecond to a nanosecond? or going faster than that. And I think this is where they're in, there's a whole class of uh, economic models and ways they th you think about things where basically it's referred to as an arms race, is we're not making anything really that much better, it's just I have to keep up with you. And so if you're faster than me, I'm gonna lose all my money. So we both keep investing because we have to, but neither one of us are better off. Mm -hmm.